the same with uh, with uh, the rest of the young generation. Even if they do make most economic sacrifices for these preferences, we know about that. But, the, but that makes it even more important for us to support this system so that it is successful for them both economically and, and uh, uh, in their lives. Um, and see, a lot of, so probably a lot of people told you, oh, you fail uh, 20,000 times. And you pay them. And absolutely this is the way, right? Isn't Pizza Hut uh, going bankrupt or, or something? I don't know. But uh, anyway, we are going there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but it, uh, another very important aspect, so when we talk about maintenance as an essential uh, feature of the circular economy, it's not only maintenance about stuff, it's maintenance of our skills. And I think this is where the current model has done most of this structure. So, I feel very sad we were talking in the car with Dan that people go and work at these uh, franchises and they don't know anything about making food, right? There are some robots that are paid nothing uh, just to uh, unfreeze some junk that was made in a factory. Every person there could have a sandwich stand and it would be, we would all be better right. off uh, uh, for that. Uh, but again, it's all, uh, so, uh, I don't patronize junk food, and if nobody will, then they will just uh, go away. But it's not only there, it's cafeteria, so IU should never sell junk food, but they do. But here is where the pressure can come from, uh, where you insist as a student, you know, it, when you are deciding for which university to go, one of the criteria can be what kind of uh, food do you uh, offer. So there are universities that have organic food in their cafeteria. Okay, you cannot have only organic, but you can insist on local, fresh, and healthy. And don't bring me uh, junk food. And this can be also a choice that students can make, and so smart university will look at it. Um, cafeterias in enterprises, they're a disaster, right? That they say they offer the convenience of eating on the premises, I would never eat there. Right, because it's only junk. How sad! Those people could all be cooking good food and maintaining and developing skills, which is what you do, instead of having no skills. And whenever that particular company goes under, there is nothing they can offer, or they cannot fall back on their feet by opening up their own uh, uh, food company. Um, so uh, again, it's up to the way we make our choices to sustain this model and let the other one uh, die. For me, I still feel bad every time I say junk food because I find it very offensive to associate food, which is uh, uh, one of the most basic needs and something that requires a lot of hard work to create, to just nonchalantly call it junk. Uh, There's but, an interesting story in, in France where they, um, the schools, they cook the food in the cafeteria. Every school has a local chef and there was a program I was watching, and um, everything is made from scratch. They're making a, you know, a, a butternut squash soup for the day for lunch, and you know these are really delicious foods, and they're doing it cheaper than we feed our kids frozen pizzas. And I mean, it, if you if you've been in the school cafeterias, I mean, when my daughter was in elementary school, I thought. Yeah, it was, the smell was more than I could handle walking in the door, and um, at first, she she said, she says, well, I want to eat school lunch, you know, a day, well, maybe a couple days, and I said, okay, that's fine, and so, um, after about a couple of weeks, she goes, could you make me lunch, you know, <laughs> so it was, it was the leftover from dinner the night before, in a hot, you know, thermos, and she had everything she wanted. She had oh, yogurt, I would like fruit. I mean, it was like a, felt like a French, you know, school cafeteria mom. And, but, but that was so much better. And so, part of what we do here, I mean, that, that's something, I don't, I don't want to get into school politics. But, you know, if we think about, it's cheaper. It's cheaper to do that locally sourced, uh, better food. But I don't know how you change that. I mean, but that's, you know, food for thought as we're talking about food, better food, uh, educating. Um, I don't know if we have that power. 
as citizens, you know, in, in this school system. Can we do that? Can we change that? This is a big food community with all these farmers markets. Um, you know, it's just something I get popped in my head. Why can't we? Mostly because we lack imagination. Yeah. Okay. We get locked into a certain paradigm, a certain way of thinking. It gets simple, and we just keep repeating it. And you might Change say it's hard. insane, but no, I, but I think uh, I think when people step forward and uh, and they show that there is another way and it's better, some people start to listen. And if you get a little pressure from the consumers, that helps a lot too. I think that's a real key part, educating people in yeah. the community, citizens. And as somebody said earlier, uh, politicians listen to voters. You know, so it's it's an idea to say, okay, if we educate, one of the things I want to do with the CSL is to um, start educating people about sustainability, sustainability strategy for businesses, how small businesses can start thinking along those lines, you know, how do I get uh, more sustainable? And it would save me money, I would be more profitable. Uh, just educating people in the community, and that gives them the knowledge which they could say, well, why isn't our city doing that? Why aren't we doing these kinds of things? I have the knowledge base now. You know, because if you ask most people what is sustainability, first thing a lot of people say is, oh, it's environmental. You know, and it's more than that. So um, part of what I'd like to do is is to educate more people in the community. You know? now, I'm on the Bloomington Commission on Sustainability. Okay, so I'm, I guess I'm in the government, kind of, sort of. You know, I'm a, I, this is, I love to say this, I'm a political appointee, you know. <laughs> Add that to my list of things. But, but, you know, I'm kind of trying to make my inroads in that way. You know, can I have influence there? Um, we'll see. You know, um, it takes more than one person, but I'm excited. You know, there's some people that are on this commission that I think have some great ideas. This town is a wealth of, has a wealth of intelligent, skilled, you know, it's like all this raw material is sitting around here. You know, and part of what we're trying to do is get, get these connections, these um, synergistic things going so that we can make it a better community. And opportunities like what you're doing, you know, with that shared kitchen, um, and you're making money, you know, I, as an accountant, it makes me... And we don't have tax abatement or any mm -hmm. tax <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, we're doing it on that. That's, so, that's wonderful. You know, yeah. those kind of success stories. Sometimes, with the, well, the CSL at some point, uh, so I'm on the board of the CSL, and uh, at some point we were thinking about our membership and we were trying to, like, extend it to, to local companies. And so we were thinking, well, what if we had, like, some sort of, like, a certification program where, like, Companies who meet certain standards that we need to set, uh, then we just like I don't, I don't know, give them a sticker or something to put outside, and, and then people can just see like this this business has been certified by the Center for Sustainability. It is somewhat of an environmentally friendly or something like that business. And I don't know that this I think it combines with the, what you're saying a little bit of like at least the part of education and then a part of like certification where these are the goals or and, and we can have maybe several levels of this membership. And this is a great time for you to tell, uh, talk about the CSL so, for sure. the people who don't have an idea what you do. Yes. So the CSL Center for Sustainable Living is a nonprofit, and we basically are an umbrella nonprofit organization. And it's been around. It's debatable whether 25 or 23 years. Uh, it was founded by Super Joe and Christina Glazer, and uh, the idea was like people who have. I don't know, so, you know, has an idea of creating a project. And instead of him having to go through all the paperwork of creating his nonprofit and spending two years dealing with all these, like, yeah, paperwork basically, uh, he comes to the CSL and he presents his project. And if it goes with our vision, which is basically educate and promote sustainability in Bloomington, so if we like it, we, the board votes and they, uh, we accept the project. And uh, the minute we accept Stephen's project, he basically inherits the nonprofit structure. So we give him like a bank account, he gets our, our Indiana tax exemption ID, um, he gets, um, we have an insurance, so like we cover the like events are really cheap because the CSL buys an insurance as a nonprofit organization. We now have this space, so there's like accessibility for the space. 
uh, we host websites and so on. So like you get a lot of benefits and the, for an, as an exchange we charge 5% of the income that any project uh, produces or generates. And none of the projects really generate that much money. And basically the money, we use it to pay the rent for this building. We have a printer, which we share among all the projects and other resources. And, and you pay for the insurance. Yeah, we pay for the insurance. And I did start a project just like you, and it totally works. Mm -hmm. and it's, <laughs> it's a great yeah, process. It's a, but you, I can't overstate the importance of that umbrella insurance in yeah. doing anything today. Mm -hmm. And to be able to add a big event like the trash in event in uh, the bus Kirk Chumley, $55 liability insurance for that event. And if you try to get that on your own, like 10x the cost, you know, it's really lowers the barrier to a lot of good stuff happening. Mm -hmm. And then also, I mean, we've, we've tried, I mean, again, the CSL is um, pretty, I mean, it's been around for a while and the board has changed and the, the projects come and go. There's a few projects that have been more constant, like the community bike project has been here for a long time in its different forms. Uh, we have a project called Discardia, which runs the trash and refashion show. So Discardia tries to um, salvage materials and reuse them in different ways. Like they, they have a mending day once a day at the library where people can come and they will help them fix their clothes. Um, Gail is amazing. She shows up with like I don't know, four or five or My more. better half scale. <laughs> more sewing know. machines, and mm -hmm. so they, they are a really cool crew. Um, we have, again, the bike project, uh, Habitat Stewards, which educates people about growing organically in their own gardens, or, and in general, garden, organic gardening, uh, urban, mostly focused. Uh, we have, I am also the co-founder with my husband, Ryan, of a project called Share Bloomington, and so Share Bloomington is all about basically the sharing economy and promoting the sharing economy. So we decided to start, we would, we create, we have events where we get sponsors and we get materials or money and we buy, we bought a bunch of wood and two by fours and things and we created all these little book libraries. So we had a workshop and people would make their little book library for, for free and take it home. We, we are trying to start our seed library. Gwen is standing behind <laughs> next to it. And we also, yeah, and we also have those little boxes up there and they're tiny seed libraries and they allow us to have them as the same as the, the book libraries on the street and so people could just put these little boxes and they're like, they have little drawers and we could store the seeds there and people could just go and take tomato seeds, plant their tomatoes and maybe next year come back and put the, tomato, the seeds in the little box. We started a tool library, which has now become a project of its own. It's called the Glenn Carter Memorial Tool Share. And so this is a friend of ours who passed away two years ago. And he decided, his family gave my husband and I and other people all his tools. So he was a middle worker. And we have, I mean, in the order of 10,000 tools, huge tools. We have like a, a tape holder. We had a plasma cutter. We have an, a hydraulic press. And we have a everything like you can possibly imagine for fixing cars, plumbing, anything. Hmm. And so it's actually back there if you want to go and see it later on. And um, so the idea is like a book library. You go and you check out a tool instead of having to buy one. I mean, how many times do you actually use a drill that you buy in your life? So why do you have to have your own and you can just share it? And the idea of the tool share is to be kind of space a little bit like what you're talking about, more about a workshop where people can come and learn skills and start building things that then they can sell. And so, I mean, we're still, we're trying to get there. It's complicated because I think you all know that Bloomington has problems with space. And uh, so right now this is the CSL space, but it's possibly, it might not be after 2016 because the city owns this building and we might have to be evacuated so that the park can be constructed. Mm. Um, what other projects does the CSL have? Did you talk about Siren? Siren, which yeah, we heard so, about yeah which we've heard about before, but Siren does renewable energy and they do a lot of education and they're, they're having these big projects right now in Brian Park. I'm signed up for my house Yay. to get <laughs> Um So uh, I'm sure we have others that I'm not mentioning. Do you have permaculture? I know Rhonda Yeah, so Rhonda, so Rhonda is the president actually right now of the board. When it, It's funny, um, the previous board kind of had been on the CSL for a long time and they were kind of tired. And so there was one day where like Rhonda, my husband Brian, I, Chandra, 
and somebody else showed up at the same time, and suddenly there was this whole transition, and we kind of like took over the board. And, run the, and the proposal was to turn the CSO into a permaculture institute. We tried for a while, we offered a few workshops and so on, but um, it just didn't work out very well. We, we, the idea was a little bit to get the projects, the different projects, like more engaged and like cooperating with each other and with the CSL as a whole. And it was hard. Like the projects are, they're, I mean, they're very active, but they're all kind of like individually doing really hard what they want to do, and it's been hard to like get them to work together more, and so it, it didn't work. So we still have like do small like many one day workshops, but it's not anymore from a culture institute. So we do have a project called Trillium, which has not totally taken off. Yeah, but it's still, it's they will come. But that's, and and that's so the idea is a little bit to have like a permaculture-ish center. We've also tried, to, uh, I don't know, there's a eco-village, Dandelion eco-village on West 8th Street, and uh, the co-op, uh, so Bloomington Cooperative Living is trying to buy Dandelion, and so the idea is that it would be a co-op house and they would have the eco-village behind, and we want to like partner with them and do something permaculture that we get there. But again, we're still working on the loan of the bank and all those things. Is there something people can do to help your organization? CSL? Yeah. Well, we always, all projects always need volunteers, and so I think that's another problem in Bloomington is that a few people are doing a lot. So just like you are wearing several hats, I also wear several hats. I'm on the board of the CSL. I have the two projects, Share Bloomington and uh, Tool Share. I do Ladies Night of the Bike project, and, and then I also, so my husband and I also, and Teddy Muller, who's on the Sustainability Commission, we started a time bank. It's called Our Bloomington. And so this is not with the CSL, but it's just another organization, basically, again, about sharing. So a time bank is just, it's a system where people exchange services, but instead of using money to pay each other, they use time. And so it, it's a really cool system because it puts every, everybody has 24 hours, right? Nobody has more than 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So everybody's equal in that sense. And there's just, there's no money involved. And so say, I need somebody to take care of my plants while I'm gone for a week. And so I ask Chris to come over and take care of my plants and he takes him, I don't know, about an hour every day. So I pay him five time credits and then Chris can use those time credits to pay somebody else when he needs help, I don't know, mowing his lawn or somebody to cook for him at night. And, and so it's not a one-to-one -one system, which is nice. It allows you to like do exchanges. I do an exchange with Chris, but then he uses the time credits to pay for something else. And um, and again, I mean, it's all about sharing, and it builds community because, again, maybe if I need somebody to come into my house and help me some, with something that requires them to be inside my house, well, I need to know this person and they need to trust them. And so it's all about community building and trying to to be a more physically resilient community. And um, so that's the other project I have. So if somebody wanted to volunteer for some of these, are they on your website? Yeah. For the CSL? Yeah. Yeah. We have to update it a little bit. Um, or to call you. We had a volunteer who wanted to do IT stuff. That would be great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps you could list um, what you need. You know? Yeah, we have a wish list okay. somewhere. Um, and we are at the Bloomington Volunteer Network. We're, we're pretty understaffed. That's that's the other. It's kind of like contradictory, but sometimes like you need volunteers, but because you don't have anybody to actually like receive those volunteers and train them, mm -hmm. then you just cannot have volunteers. Right? Happens a lot. The bike project is a great example for that. Like the bike project is great, and everybody loves it. But we, because Bloomington has this like population that's constantly changing, like we get volunteers, and then the summer comes, and they leave, and then there's nobody there. And so other people come and they're new and they want to volunteer at the bike project, but they don't have any bike skills, so you have to train them. So the volunteers actually first become like a, they require more time so that you can train them. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have the staff to put in that time, then you just cannot get new volunteers. And so it's this vicious cycle. So it, it's really difficult to manage like the volunteers. I, what I'd like to suggest though is not just about volunteering. I think there's great opportunities for participation in fulfilling your own needs. So if you have a bicycle and it needs some fixing up, well, 
go to the bike project, learn how to fix it up, learn how to, that sort of thing, instead of buying a new bicycle, that sort of thing. Uh, if you have some clothes that need some mending, that hey, it's a favorite shirt, whatever, and you, you don't know how to fix it yourself, you don't have a sewing machine, well, you can go to mending day. Yeah. And, and I think that is as significant as the volunteer aspect. Yeah, definitely. So that's so one of the problems, that, the problems with the time bank has been a little bit that, like, uh, Ryan and I have gone around and given presentations at commissions, at, uh, I don't know, churches, at um, homes for elder, elder people, and everybody's super excited, but we always have trouble, like, for the people to do, like, the one last step of actually going to the orientation and signing up. And so the time bank is kind of, like, it's kind of stuck in this point where like we have a few people and all people have very similar needs. They all want everybody wants gardening help, <laughs> and so we just we are at the point where nobody goes, nobody does exchanges, and nobody gets anywhere because everybody needs gardening help, and I need the gardening help. And if I have time, I'm probably going to work first in my garden and go and <laughs> somebody else. Can you and apply to take a Baracor volunteers? Because I know I was a Vista a couple times when I was younger and. AmeriCorps Volun America Vistas, anyway, go into your organization, and their job is to find volunteers and train them and manage them. So could yeah. you apply to get AmeriCorps volunteers yeah, to help your organization? Yeah, the bike project, and it, it did help, but, um, mm. but they stayed really short time. So yeah, there's different programs, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. Anyway, Vista might be an option. They stay for a year, and their whole job is to recruit volunteers and make it a sustainable thing. Yeah, so. that's good. Anybody else want to? Yes. Um, I am Nejla, and I brought my cards. <laughs> and pass those around. Um, and um, I'm here also wearing a few hats. So I work for IV Tech um, teaching business. And um, but I hope I try to be one of the good business people. Sometimes when I say that, people immediately like look at you sideways in Bloomington, like, oh, you teach business. <laughs> you know, your life revolves around money, right? They look looking like you're a sleaze ball, and I'm, you know. So, but I try to be one of the good people. I I've known Jeff for like 10 years. Yeah. I didn't know you were doing a lot of this stuff, so I'm really glad you guys put this on to give us a chance. I mean, I've known about the Center for Sustainable Living. I've met your husband a couple of times posted things on the Facebook page, but again, I didn't know all the stuff you're doing, so thanks, you know, for this opportunity to kind of, because I, I, everything I've heard, there's so many connections I want to make, right, Chris? So, um, yeah, let me start with IB Tech. So, um, yeah, I do teach business there. I teach business ethics, international business, um, and digital marketing and business strategy, uh, and, um, so partly, I'm, the things I'm learning here, I'm going to take back to my classes as much as possible, right? Some of the stuff is already included in the, in the books. A lot of times they aren't, so I bring in documentaries and things like that. So any suggestions that you had for educational tools would be helpful. Um, documentaries go over really well. Um, so that sort of thing would be great. Um, and the other kind of hat I'm wearing is representing IV Tech is... You know, Ivy Tech is all about uh, creating a, a, a workforce for Indiana, and our mission is both to serve, um, you know, afford, to provide affordable education, so we're serving the underserved um, constituents of Bloomington, but also to serve the employers, right, to create that workforce. So from what I've heard, there's a lot of connections that can be made through Ivy Tech, so I'd like to help facilitate that. Um, specifically, it was a lot of stuff I heard around, like food. I work with um, Stacy Strand, who's an instructor in hospitality and culinary at Ivy Tech. They have a big hospitality culinary program, and she is totally into this stuff. Like, me and her got together, and we're planning a talk on global food economics. We're bringing in an IU uh, geography PhD candidate to talk about you know, how the U.S. agricultural subsidies, and then, uh, you know, and it's really the obesity epidemic, and they're dumped under the third world, and then their farmers go out of business, and that whole cycle, we're going to be, you know, bringing that up to our staff and faculty and inviting people from IU. Um, and so, yeah, we're, you know, I am definitely want to continue to be a part of that, make connections where possible, and, um, Oh, and in addition, Ivy Tech has the Cook Center for Entrepreneurship. So Ivy Tech is also training a lot of the small business people in Bloomington, and even some of the bigger businesses in Bloomington, like Cook and Baxter, they send a lot of their folks through um, through our classes. So 
Ivy Tech, you know, I think we, we can make some really good connections here. And I would highly encourage any of you guys to contact me, you know, for any kind of connections or partnerships that you can think of with the college, and I can try to help. I'm on, I'm on the Global Studies uh, Committee. I think we need a sustainability committee at Ivy Tech. Um, because that would be faculty and administrators who are dedicated to that purpose. Um, and Ivy Tech is definitely constantly, like, has their ears out for the community, what the community wants. So I really think um, Ivy Tech's a good starting place for a lot of this stuff. Um, so my other hat that I come here wearing is that of um, a uh, rental or a land landlord, I guess. So um, I have some rental property a few blocks that way. Um, I actually bought an old triplex and renovated it. Um, so that in itself is a little sustainable. We put some native like plants around there that's sort of sustainable. But um, I'm trying to go really big with sustainability on my next project. Um, so I have some property that's on the Beeline Trail about, a about between a half a mile and a quarter mile this way. And it's literally adjacent to the Beeline Trail, so pretty close to where we are here. And um, we've been talking to the city, and uh, Chris Reinhart is working uh, with me as a sustainable architectural designer. And we're uh, hoping to build a, um, a sustainable rental community. So um, I know, like, the Dandelion Village was, is something that's still, you know, working, they're working on, and that's more of a co-op model our model is going to be a rental community these are going to be rental hopefully tiny houses um and we really want it to be a you know consciously designed community right so a lot of the stuff you were talking about as far as like sharing you know work sharing and things like that i was already hoping to design into part of this community where maybe everyone who lives there you know they're sort of required in addition to the rent they pay to give a few hours a week, you know, to somehow in this community. And it could be, like you said, like cutting hair for someone. Someone else needs their dog walked. Maybe if there's an elderly person who lives there, maybe you just spend time and talk with someone, you know, whether they're elderly or not. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants someone to talk to, right? And if that's what you have to offer, <coughs> fine. That's a valuable skill. Um, so, yeah. Um, I made some notes because I can never stay on subject. Um, so we're looking for community partners of all kinds right now. We're in the beginning stages of this. Um, we do have the property. We have zoning. We're, we've been talking to city people, but we're continuing in that direction. Um, and so we're definitely looking for partners of all kinds throughout the community. I'd love to partner with the Center for Sustainable Living, not least of which since we're so close. Um, and all over Indiana, it would be wonderful to learn about any other types of initiatives that have that are that exist in Indiana or even in kind of the Midwest region. That's sort of some research that I'm working on because I'd like to learn best practices for um, for sustainable community design. And obviously, you know, we don't want to reinvent the wheel on everything. So um, there is that. Um, so yeah, we're looking for any anyone else who uh, knows about sustainable community design, sustainable financing, um, and uh, and we're hoping that what we'll have will be a model that will serve for the bigger developers in town to want to model some of what we're doing, right? Like you said, um, with the organic food. Stuff, you know, it started with a few hippie organic food grocery stores, and now every Kroger has a huge organic yeah, section, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, because they basically had to, because yeah. business just yeah. dictated that. So we'd like the same thing to happen to the rental market in Bloomington. We know that there's a lot of really bad landlords here. You know, that's something everybody <laughs> agrees on. So, I mean, unfortunately, it makes it really easy to be just a little better, you know. If you're just t slightly better than that, you know, you can get renters. So, you know, our motivation isn't just, well, let's just be slightly good enough so we can get the runners. We, you know, I, I love Bloomington. I've lived here since I, I came here in 97. Um, I've lived here off and on. I've lived in a few different countries, and I lived in D.C. But, you know, Bloomington's always called me back. I'm one of those people. And I love this community. I love this neighborhood. Um, I live a few blocks away. And, you know, I, 
I also, you know, share your view. I'm a bit pessimistic about the overall, you know, the overall, our overall outlook. But, yeah, it doesn't, that doesn't matter, you know, because, I mean, it does matter. But, you know, I can only control what I can control within my, my purview, right? And I think, you know, if we can make our community great, and even if just my neighborhood or a little community, to me, that's, that's making a huge difference, you know? Um, so that's my motivation. And I love the learning about the Zingerman's open management model. Um, I followed something like that when, I, when we had that catering business because I would take all the employees and train them and offer them and say, okay, so you're, you're a, a waiter, but you want to learn how to cook. Okay, let's see how we can get you trained on that. And um, so I totally uh, buy into that. And I would, I definitely want to, you know, talk to anyone here who's interested. I'm starting up an advisory board, so I want to talk to anyone who's interested in, uh, you know, giving us feedback, ideas, all that stuff. Um, and yeah, if you're if you're doing some CSL certification, that'd be great. Chris is um, Chris is the expert on living building certification. That's what we're going for. It's one of the more rigorous. Um, certifications. There's also like a living community uh, certification. So we're going to be going for those. Fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah, thanks. I guess I would also encourage you to write something for the city for the comprehensive master plan because as it stands, like little houses are just uh, being. Well, Chris has met with the um, building people and the tiny houses because I know part of the master plan um, is. Well, that, slightly different, but he's meeting with them at least for that, for the building and planning stuff for the tiny houses. Yeah, you're right. I mean, yeah. with, the, with the comprehensive master plan, and that's, those are all planning issues. Mm -hmm. And like you talked about, you know, the building department and planning departments are totally different animals, and yeah. the building department is, is quite agreeable, it seems. Mm -hmm. um, and the planning department is sort of a challenge. The code has to be changed so that you can build those houses. Uh, well, not for the not on the building end of things. Oh, okay. Yeah, on the building end of things, it's all. I mean, um, I guess there's a lot of technicalities there. You couldn't build the things you see on television now. They, they don't need code, and that's because they're not safe. And and even as somebody who designs weird structures, I think that a lot of tiny houses really aren't safe, and I wouldn't want you know somebody I love living in. <laughs>